Hello, hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you're listening to The Long Game Podcast. This episode is a part of our Kitchen Side series, where we pull back the curtain and show you the behind-the-scenes conversations, debates, strategies, and brainstorming sessions that we have at our agency. And today's topic is going to be media marketing, or rather, how to think like a media company. For this one, we brought on a friend of the podcast, Ronnie Higgins, the former director of content at Hopin, and also a former podcast guest. So today we're going to cover what media marketing even means, what it means to think like a media company, uh, some companies that are doing it well and why they're doing it well, uh, why you should maybe think about acting like a media company, and if you choose this route, how to get buy-in, how to make the case to your executives to approach content marketing in this way. Without further ado, here is this episode of The Long Game Podcast. Let's do the discussion on media marketing. I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know, you know, like we'll we'll basically treat this as a discussion. And Ronnie, you've obviously got much more. I think you've thought about this more maybe than than us or or many other people um, in the content yeah. space. So I, I, I got think some notes too. Think like about it differently. The, yeah, like that's the thing I've been. The reason you've started to hear me talking more about it is I'm trying to nudge everybody to think a little bit differently about it because right now it's a little too hyperbole of building a media company and mm -hmm. there's i think there's like a lot of backlashes just because there's not enough substance to it like i think even david uh posted about this recently of just like these are words like that people throw around but they don't actually have stuff to like add the substance to it Sorry, I cut you off there. No, no. I think that that's a good place to start because when I hear these things, I hear platitudes often. Yeah. Like David might have posted about this where it was like, content is king. Every company should be a media company. And that, when you really like go past and think for more than two seconds, the first thought should be like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, like there's a bunch of different kinds of media companies and they monetize differently. They they don't typically have like uh you know monthly kind of like subscription options like a SaaS company would, or you know they don't sell direct purchases often like an e-commerce company would. So when someone says every company is a media company or should think like a media company, what does that even mean? Like what what is the defining characteristic of a media company, and like what are people saying like software companies should do that is like a media company? So I've been dissecting what other people mean just by putting the question out there, meeting with a lot of people, and I've noticed a few patterns. One, there's a cohort of people that are saying, be a, become a media company, there's a media company inside or with a software, all the different ways the platitude gets shaped. That really just means content marketing. Like they're they're taking like we've been in this long enough that back when we started the term was act like be like become a publisher now everybody's just taking publisher and saying media company instead and it's because we are uh content marketing before was like before content marketing uh there was content marketing but it was all self-centered it was all product education brochures whatnot uh content marketing brought in this extra layer of problem solution content of tackling keywords and getting around and what i think is happening when people are talking about building a media company they're just saying blog, blog plus hmm. so have a blog have a podcast have a blog have a podcast have some course certification program um, then there's a cohort of people who are seeing things like MailChimp presents and they're like, oh, so you have a blog, but that's like separate. You need to have a media company and it's, uh, documentaries and stuff about just the audience. And that's a media company in the same way. National Geographic is a media company. It's educational, it's informational. Um, and then there are the smaller subset are the people who are like okay we are moving into 
from this idea of content marketing based off of print uh, media to being based off of different mediums and multimedia and most specifically because of the rise of video broadcasting and there's a few people uh really one sticks out the most more than others is patrick and profit well and thinking like in about their audience in a way that's like how do i develop content that it's not just, oh, here's problem solution, but here's like this thing that they tune into on a daily, weekly basis. And mm -hmm. how does it fit into their life? Like, what are their consumer behaviors and needs? And then how do I not just put things out there and just tackle topics, but how do I create franchises? So how do I, like, if you think of like shows, a show is a franchise, but so is like a ongoing written series, like a book series. So like, a written franchise would be like uh blank for dummies mm -hmm. right so there's like that is a franchise so thinking of it as or i'm trying to think of like cliff notes is a another thing that's a franchise and you just know the like packaging back to the medium is the message that i was saying before we were recording is that's like what i see as thinking like a media company or not so much building, but more thinking like a media company, applying media theory, media strategies that broadcasters and like omni-channel um, media companies employ like Disney or Marvel, where they don't just publish a bunch of stuff. They actually think, how does this all work together to sell the other thing, to get customers that don't just watch the movies, but the TV shows and the comics, that also go to the store to buy merchandise and go to the theme parks to ride the rides. And they think about the whole package and how all of the franchises sort of operate in that framework of distribution channel formats. And I think that is more thinking like a media company. Marvel is probably a good example that we should dive into later. But one thing you mentioned on the, the, the idea of the franchise. Um, Hasn't that been, I mean, like, maybe I'm misunderstanding the, the concept of the franchise, but like even in, in print journalism, uh, you know, you've got like the Atlantic and they've got a bunch of other blog plus kind of things going on now with like podcasts and I'm sure that, you know, videos and whatnot, but like they have columns um, where like Arthur C. Brooks, I believe writes one on like life lessons and happiness. And that's something that you can kind of like follow week by week. Ali, you did a series at HubSpot on, um, experiments that we ran internally i can't remember what you called it hubspot at work or something like that oh yeah <laughs> it was my first foray into thought thought leadership um like leveraging internal happenings and not writing about you know basically a collection of external lessons um i guess i didn't see it as a, as a series at the time but it was and it it really wasn't rooted in any measurable besides like traffic. Uh, it wasn't part of our SEO program. So I guess it was a little bit of an offshoot at the time, but not to the level that, that HubSpot is pursuing now. Do you think like that some, so like the medium kind of makes sense to me that like things are so centralized in the blog that maybe there's like, I don't know about backlash, but some idea that we need to like proliferate our content production and meet the audience in different places. But um, maybe I'm misunderstanding some people when they say media marketing, um, but I hear sometimes is that there's a backlash against simple SEO driven content and very performance driven content marketing. Mm -hmm. And what I hear when people say, I want to build a media company is they want to tackle more creative initiatives that may be less directly attributable. And at HubSpot, they used to say this thing. It was like, um, we're, we're trying to win hearts and we're winning minds. And winning mm -hmm. minds was doing things like how to build an email list and doing very SEO driven stuff. And the winning hearts was things like contrarian thought leadership and probably the hustle and things that like reach people in more of an emotional way. But like that seems to me to be a little less measurable. And it, it seems like marketers are just tired of like having to like directly attribute everything they do. And maybe it's like, hey, let's try some creative stuff that lets us stand out. Or is that a misunderstanding of what people are talking about? No, I mean, I think so. Um, so I think Ali's, even though it wasn't purposely uh, approached the way we we're talking about it today fits the mold mm -hmm. uh it's the idea of instead of just writing about a topic 
what is the frame? How is it going to be consumed? What is the like essence of premise of this thing? Like people talk about premise when they talk about podcasts, but there should be a premise to every type of content. And it's what makes it sticky. And I think the backlash to SEO should be continuing to think of like, you could still do SEO content, but like this. Yeah. Whiteboard mm. Friday was the same idea. It was a franchise. That's a great that, example. Whiteboard Friday. So like, and think about that. That stuff showed up in search results. Right. It does. And, and so the idea that like SEO content or traditional blog content should be separate from this idea is for lack of a better word, like bullshit. Like it's mm-hmm. just a misunderstanding of the idea. Uh, and the idea of like the hustle, I feel like the hustle, like, uh, what's his name? Karen, like he totally understands what he's doing with getting the hustle on board. He is understanding that there's an audience, a repeat audience and that what the hustle does it separate from what people are doing with like SEO content is there's like a layer above. And if we're talking about like the funnel or a uh, distance from the product that most people don't do in content, which is like lifestyle content and lifestyle content does not mean that it's product agnostic. You can do a lifestyle piece that is about the product. It just isn't selling the product. It's like, I can't think of a really good example, but like just maybe you're Apple and you want to do a, a, a lifestyle thing about blue bubbles versus uh, green bubbles or something like that, which is something that is just part of our culture or lifestyle. But you also just happen to be using the product as the example. I think, sorry um, to interrupt, I think Webflow did something like that with basically they were launching like a video product uh, within like their CMS and they produced like this whole docu series, or I can't remember the exact thing that they did, but it was not, it wasn't about like web design or it wasn't like about how to build a CMS or like whatever like specific product things, but they use the tools that they were selling to showcase this interesting, entertaining content. So that would be something where they weave the product in, but it's not the centerpiece. Yeah. But that's the difference between that and say, I'm trying to categorize stuff right now and come up with some like rigid taxonomy. So this might change after we record this. So if I call it something different later, I'm sorry, but there's like product education. So stuff that is very specifically about the product, whether it's trying to be product marketing versus customer education, still in that same room. Case studies are in that same place. Then there's problem solution content that is product agnostic. It's like, all the stuff that HubSpot taught us to do 10 years ago. Uh, How to do inbound marketing, stuff like that. Yeah. And then the lifestyle. So it's like, what is it that your audience, what is in their, their lexicon, their culture? What is it that they get together about? And that is stories about one another. So community driven content. So if I was to do a story on Alex and just how he did this thing and why he's awesome and things that he like his war stories but um never talking about an actual product it's there so that others in who are in my target demographic can extract the lessons and that's like the the like the analogy there is like it's the water cooler everybody gathers around Mm -hmm. then there's like you know i guess industry reports like trends fit in a problem solution too but you could also just do uh gen pop surveys so not industry surveys but gen pop surveys would definitely fit into lifestyle it's like uh that's not about like pain points or problems like here are like mental health uh is a thing that we tackled at hop and did really had a really good success with where it was like we never talked about the product we just got people to talk about their mental health we got them to do it because it was an actual thing that people were starting to talk about and we wanted to amplify and normalize how people were talking about that so that we would give people a platform and help people in a way that had nothing to do with their like uh professional um pain points but just something that was part of their lifestyle because like their mental health led into like their personal life too right yeah let me ask a question on that uh well two first off was that that was blog based interviews so we did the interviews 
in behind closed doors and we basically talked with them and by we it's actually my previously senior managing editor uh, melissa lombard uh, who spearheaded the project and got everybody's story figured out what their story was got all the like nitty-gritty details and then ghost wrote for them now some people we sent them their our ghost written and they were like hey so i'm also a writer so let me just do my own version of it and so uh that was how we did those so we didn't do them as audio video because first off we didn't have a channel yet um part of the reason i didn't get as far as i wanted to in this building a media company at Hoppin was things were a little too siloed uh not siloed but different teams so like the video and audio stuff was on a different team from my team and I was spent the last year getting everybody to work together and then everybody got laid off so right was there a tie-in with Hoppin's product strategy and other content marketing strategies or as mental health I could see I mean it's a topic that was becoming more salient but I could see another company doing that. But I could also like logic myself into thinking like Hoppin, you know, served remote, um, mm-hmm. you know, like basically like uh, video, like digital summits and stuff like that. And like during the pandemic, it felt like mental health became increasingly salient and like, you know, all the isolation and stuff. So like, why did you, why did you like with the hustle, it's, you know, startups and like entrepreneurship and stuff like that, where maybe eventually that flows down to somebody using HubSpot. Um, was there a, a logic behind choosing that as the lifestyle theme uh i mean it was there first off like people were talking about it um they weren't searching for it it was just something we noticed in our uh our icps we were talking about it uh we ended up doing an event that then resonated and then the post we did about the event which was another first person narrative uh was uh, successful. It was like our second most popular uh, post. And so we decided to double down on it for May mental health awareness. The the same, the, the reason for doing it is the same reason you do SEO content. You do SEO content because you know that it's a doorway to your store, which is your website. It's, it's an entry point. And the difference between SEO content and say the mental health lifestyle series is that it had built in distribution. When we did stories with Corey Haynes, when we did stories with uh, Deborah, uh, um, blanking on her last name, but um, she's going to kill me for that too. She hears <laughs> this, uh, but Deborah, like all these people, they posted this stuff on their network and it brought right. people to the site. And what happens when anybody goes and looks at their traffic, if you've got good content, the next step majority of your audience does is go to look at the other content you have. And if you have the right media mix, you then are going to create someone, it's product led uh, growth strategy of like you first acquire, so that's acquire someone, next is activate and or engage then activate. And so engage is like, all right, good. The first piece of content got them to come. It needs to then need to like get them to go further down the rabbit hole. Then I need to get them to be activated. So become a member slash just sign up for the newsletter, something that allows us, gives us permission to keep in touch with you versus waiting for you to come back via another search. Uh, and instead of doing that on a rented platform like LinkedIn or Twitter, like we're asking you to access to your inbox. And so the idea is like the mental health, you just take that for any other topic, whether it's story driven content. We had a piece, uh, a series that was going to be coming after this that was narrative based, just like think of like it was inspired by Vox and how like they do deep dives into sort of uh topics and like Mm -hmm. you know things that you took for granted but you never really got deeper into it one um the entry point was we were going to do the roman coliseum and gladiator fights and how so much of what they were doing to get butts and seats is what event organizers do today like Mm. take selling tickets to a seat doing like uh affiliate marketing all these different things and sponsorship uh and so and how they even selected the gladiators there was going to be this whole thing of like 
nothing's new under the sun kind of thing. And the whole point of that is it it sort of evokes, uh, it has like, uh, what is the word I'm looking for here? I call it like jobs to be done. Like all of the product solution content are like, I have a barrier I need to get it past. But that's only one job that content can do. Why do you consume all of the other content that you consume in what most research says seven hours a day you're consuming content? What is that other content? And sometimes it's it's uh, infotainment, so like educationtainment, so like things that are ancillary to your interests and help you dive deeper into it. That's why I uh, was re- recently asked about this, and I pointed out um, uh, I'm blanking on her last name, but Caitlin uh, with her whole like why we buy series and the psychology and how like marketers love that stuff because it helps them better understand because I think there's this whole generation of marketers who are so fixated on tactics and metrics that they've forgotten that it's actually humans that you're trying to influence and what is it that they're doing that you need to influence and how do you understand that behavior a little bit better how do you understand their biases to understand how your message is going to get received and I think that fits the, the mold too. And we probably would have done that if it wasn't already done, or maybe even hired her to do a whole series on it. Um, that's great. Uh, people are going to want specific context, I think, with the media marketing and the, the, the ideas is, I think you put it like you want to think like a media company, not replicate a media company. So yes. um, let's, let's talk about ourselves here. Um, I want to talk about myself. Uh, we're trying to, I think our approach is like a media company. But I'm sure we have a lot of room to go. Um, how do how do I frame this, Ali? What 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 is our marketing strategy? I mean, we do the kitchen side series. That's kind of a serialized um, franchise of sorts. We do the podcast where we get interviews with people, Ronnie, like yourself, and you share that with your network. So we do that kind of strategy. We do bottom funnel blog posts, direct sales, and a bunch of events. We do like office hours twice a month. And we do. We're doing a huge event uh, this October uh, called the Road to Mastery. So that's kind of our big virtual summit. Yeah, yeah. But we yeah, do yeah. very was... little in the middle. We we almost do exclusively brand building activities, uh, which I would yeah. consider the media marketing side, and then very directly attributable ABM sales. Um, mm-hmm. So are we thinking like a media company? Yeah. So there's, for all intents and purposes, I see there being three there's jobs to be done for the consumer of content, but then there's reasons a brand publishes content and there's the uh, trying to make sure I don't mess these up. There's aid. No, not aid. How do I want to say, I want to say it as in like enable purchase. So someone's already at that decision-making process. They want to learn more about the product. So like someone going like, it's like landing pages and stuff about your product or services. Uh, On top of that is earn trust. So what you're doing with the podcast is you're earning trust. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kitchen side, you're earning trust because you are, um, the way this series is set up is you're basically showing people how you figure out their strategy. Like Mm -hmm. they don't get, to see the homework as much so this is like an opportunity to show what happens behind the scenes you meet with thought leaders or yourselves to sort of uh discuss a topic in depth to make sure that you can deliver the goods for a customer um but then on top of that is brand affinity and so why would you post a meme or why would i why would you do a a spotify playlist that just is about modern marketers and using the titles the way everyone does or something like that like that is just to say hey like this is us this Mm. is like you know um i I don't think we do a lot of that though i don't know if we do as much of that i mean with our twitter like i feel like maybe we tweet a lot yeah i don't think i wouldn't discredit you from being a media company if you're not doing it but if you're doing stuff that you know is building brand affinity then yes. So are you Allie, saying, oh yeah, so go ahead. Are you saying you're not saying that that's the order in which those have to happen? They're just three no. separate actions. Three separate things and 
Yeah. Like if a company has strong product led growth, like they are the only shop in town, they are our only product in town and it's really amazing. Like it just, people sign up for it. They already have gravity. So, but the thing is they think they still need some sort of like enable purchase content. They need something to get someone to click buy, click sign up, click contact sales. There's something that needs to like articulate the value to someone who, even if you've been word of mouth referred, you still need to do some self research. Um, and then I think if that might be all you need, I've actually um, met with some CMOs to help them figure out their stuff. And I said, look, that's all you need. I don't think I can help you. Like you just need to hire some technical uh, writers to do your documentation and developers are going to gobble that up and think it's um, and start telling people to adopt your product because your documentation is awesome. You don't need SEO. Uh, so like that inherently earns trust, but it's, its main primary goal is the, to enable the purchase. Uh, brand affinity is something you can do for that same uh, example of a product-led growth is with Dovetail, when I was um, referred to them about a year and a half ago. So Dovetail is a research repository uh, platform like Notion for research. And when I met with them, it was pretty apparent that it was going to be a long, hard road to build their SEO content strategy. Like researchers weren't researching what their pain points were because they they were coming from academia. They were like the top of their game. They weren't like a salesperson becoming a researcher or something like that. Like some marketing and other uh, SaaS company uh, roles are. So they were a very um, say educated there was no documentation they really needed like it, the free trial was enough for you to go in see what you needed to do and understand the product if you were a researcher so we decided that what they needed was something that to help build brand affinity brand awareness and so we set it up a process where they would talk to researchers to just say what's your war story tell us how you do your research like it's like the cutting room tommy's cutting room before mm -hmm cutting room but for researchers uh and that was what put dovetail on the map they already had the like now that they had the the building affinity stuff they're now i'm still talking to their uh head of content and they're now building the earn trust and the how to's in the last like six months or so and so i think acting like a media company doesn't mean you always need to do all of it but it's the idea of thinking about how does thinking of media strategy instead of just thinking about SEO content or how to like um, tackle, you know, have a blog. It's, it's like not just checking off boxes. It's like doing what broadcasters did, which goes back to the whole content is king thing. Cause if you reread Bill Gates's 1996 essay, he says contents where I see most of the real money on the internet being made uh, much in the way uh, broadcasters do today. So he was talking about like how broadcasters operated, not how publishers and uh, operated. And he even talks about content being anything. He even said software was content back then. Mm. And so it's this idea of like taking content as king in the original context and thinking about what is it that we need to do to use media which is synonymous with content. The only reason I use media marketing instead of content marketing is to get create a knowledge gap so people have a pause to think wait i know content marketing but what's media marketing for all intents and purposes it's content marketing plus social media marketing plus event marketing plus brand marketing plus like a bunch of other stuff it's just the idea of looking at the media landscape of what your goals are and figuring out how to use media to reach engage um attract all of the different things to get them and pull them into your orbit and i would say the reason that i separate it from content marketing even though content marketing is like a subset of it is that seo driven content is focused on um, search which every company i've looked i've worked for and i wish i could get access to like everybody's ga 
so I could prove this even bigger sample size, is if you look at your GA and you look at the recency and frequency of a co of your um your search traffic, I guarantee you you're gonna see a like um the next jump in traffic from the your cohorts are gonna be in that 15 to 30 day range, meaning that you have customers who are returning 15 to 30 days later. Now that's good. You want that, but that's the baseline. Everyone's going to have that. So what do you have to do to engage them on a more frequent basis? Now, I know um, when we you posted about like what questions we wanted to talk, ask about or talk about here, um, Kaylee, I think it was Kaylee said something about the, how do you get, how do you make a case for media marketing? Um, let's use the example. So most of my experience has been in B2B SaaS. I have some B2C um, and D2C, but for B2B SaaS, usually it's a year contract or more, right? Today, I'm trying to sell you a product, my product, and you pass because pricing wasn't right. You, the next engagement with you, if I leave it up to just sales, is maybe like a year from now. And if I don't engage you in a year, the chance of you remembering us or my product or service is pretty low. I mean, people forget about that stuff all the time. They always have to go, what was that other product we're looking at? And they got to go, maybe there's also a turnaround. There's no one around to remember. Um, or they think, oh yeah, we were, we were looking at them, but they were too uh, expensive. So don't even put them in the top three. But what if you had a pricing change? What if you added new features between that year? And how do you make sure that the audience that your customers know outside of their buying cycle so that you're sort of like sending those messages outside of the buying cycle? And so that by the time the uh, buying cycle is triggered, oh, we have like a Hoppins an example. Our annual conference is coming up. We need to look at software. At that moment, if I've done my job right with how I think about media uh, and media marketing, you would have had us top of mind that whole time between the um, declining us and passing on us for a competitor. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Or did I ramble too much? So media marketing and the, the channels that you're referring to, in addition to content marketing, I think what I'm hearing is what... All keep, of it. Yeah. All, all of it. It's what keeps brands top of mind. Yeah. because Even if there's I've, a sale. I think the hard part there though is like when you know you make that case you have to like you have to make the case that it's marginally more efficient to do that than to like do remarketing or display ads or some other uh kind of more proven um quote unquote channel. Um so it, I think it still takes a leap of faith on the part of the executive that grants that budget for things that are outside of their usual experience. I don't want to waste time going to google it but what would you just guess is the average budget for paid spend i would guess it's a lot more than content so here's something that has diminishing return on investment year over year yet i mean gets millions of it dollars pumped into it and it's just continuing to diminish like why wouldn't you put that into organic well and it it was cool, Ronnie, when you called into question like those seven, eight hours we spend consuming. I don't yeah. spend hours looking at ads that are remarketed to me. I ignore that. <laughs> so if you call in, if you consider psycho like buyer, consumer, Dude. content consumer psychology, a media marketing program, even though it might be a little bit more nebulous in terms of like return or performance, it definitely matches the way that people consume content today more so than anything that might be paid. It might be easier to track that paid performance, which I know executives love. So the case for it is just as much a leap of faith as it is probably meeting people where they are more so than anything else. Yeah. I think there's some things too. Like I almost wanted to start off with like a base, like a st let's establish a baseline of like truth. <laughs> so paid advertising sucks and continues to suck more. Like just, there's ways to squeeze blood from the turnip. And I know some people who do really amazing jobs at it. So I don't want to like discredit it completely. Uh, but it, it, if it's your only channel, you're going to be continually spending money um, and pay, spending more money. Uh, the web is decentralized. 
when we first started doing content marketing, majority of people were on like a handful of net, uh, social networks and websites. Um, the platforms that we used to use, even if they are still have your audience on it, are pretty stingy gatekeepers. Like they just don't send you, you know, the followers you built, basically you never see your content unless like you're spamming them. And then the last is that content is a commute, a commodity. And like you um, are not just the only player. I remember when I went from uh, Eventbrite to Udemy, Udemy really solidified this idea for me because the type of content that we needed to publish, I wasn't just competing against Coursera and LinkedIn learning. I was competing against like Harvard Business Review and like all of these major business insider I was doing all of like all the keywords that I needed to rank for were like not just like SaaS companies with content operations. I was going up against like legacy publications on the topics I needed to go up against. And so um, to kind of circle back to it of like why you need to like think about it and all of these different things is that at every company I've worked with and for, there's like a disconnect where like social is just like doing its own thing over here and its content strategy separate from the uh con like the blog typical mm -hmm. content strategy um it's usually got some integration and connection to it community has its own content strategy so there's like i the reason i keep wanting to use media versus content uh marketing is to just help people think that you need to put all of the content that an entire company is producing and putting out there under one roof. And I know that that then goes, oh, well, that's going to be more than what we're paying for paid. It's because you're not thinking about how to create it. And everyone talks about repurposing. But I think when you look at the whole landscape of all the media you need to produce, you can actually do it for less than your paid spend budget. One thing that's interesting that you mentioned offhand is I think the competition in a space would, would kind of suggest uh, the strategy. So like for us, the reason we didn't try to go after keywords like what is content marketing is because HubSpot and CoSchedule and Hootsuite and literally every MarTech company has written about them and they've been writing about them for like 10 plus years. So we're like, we have to find a different way to reach people. And like, that's why we started to think outside the box, but why we started to do a podcast in the first place, but why we started to look into events. And then we realized that like, this is sort of a barbell strategy. So doing all of this media and like brand affinity and like kind of interesting content, it's going to drive links over time. And that's going to help us target some of those last competitive, but bottom funnel keywords that are actually going to bring in, you know, it's going to be like 50 search volume, but like those people are going to be very high intent. Versus trying to go for that middle water where it's like very high competition. We're probably not going to beat, you know, the HBRs in, in your example or the HubSpots in our example. So I think like the more competition there is, the more reason to like think outside the box and think about how are we differentiating and building something that people are latching onto versus just discovering in the channel where frankly, it's too crowded that we're never going to compete. Oh, exactly. I think that's totally ex exactly the point and why you should be thinking that's probably the entire thesis of being thinking like a media company is who is my, you know, audience, uh, where are they, what are they doing? What are they consuming? What are they talking about? It's the reason why spark Toro is so awesome. Like guess spark Toro will tell you like, Oh, I need to, you know, get some uh, press in here or be a guest on that podcast. But I also use it for keyword research because it tells you what people aren't searching for. Here's what people are talking about. Uh, their whole free tool of here's what all the top posts that people were sharing give you an idea of like what's top of mind for your audience so that you can actually be part of the broader community and not chasing after like things that people search for every now and then. Um, and this I harkens back to our like old, we, we talked about red, o red ocean versus blue ocean SEO on the last kitchen side. And I published an article about it. Um, but basically most of us are in red oceans at this point, like our companies and our industries. So it's all about like, no matter what industry you're in, you're probably in a competitive space. And if not, you know, do the basic shit and it's going to work for a while. 
But I think all of us want to find that blue ocean strategy that still allows us to stand out. And this whole approach sounds to me like trying to find your blue ocean within a more competitive space. Yeah. Like there's the Atlantic, there's the New York Times, there's, you know, like there's tons and tons of similar publications, but like each of them has a a particular flavor, a tonality, a reason you go to them versus the other ones. I mean, that's why I think too, like thinking like broadcasters, I think it was something else you tapped into that you wanted to talk about was um, when cable news came out or not cable news, cable, just television, like there's so like, yes, there was MTV, but then there was MTV and VH1. And so like what made those different? Um, you have today, what's the difference between, you know, Netflix and Disney plus and Amazon prime uh, video? Like what is it that makes them unique is usually their franchises, the properties within them. Uh, and so it's thinking in that way, but also like what are you using those franchises to sort of convey the broader brand of like, what is it you stand for and what are you known for? And so I think that also ties into like, that's the blue ocean is like, uh, not the blue ocean, but maybe another way to say this is if every media is becoming a media company, I mean, if every company is becoming a media company, what happens when every company is already a media company, then what is your strategy? Like, are you going to say, so everybody needs to be a VR company or some metaverse? Then then we all go back to SEO. (laughs) <laughs> yeah like the pendulum swings that, right back and i think that's where like the stuff that i'm trying to develop like a resource a course and stuff is to think about this stuff to think about how like uh tnt's turner time uh if you're not familiar with this all of their shows started five minutes after the hour why because they knew people changed channels and if their shows started five minutes after the hour they knew that you would land on their, um, their station and you would be tuning into the very beginning of the hook of the show and stay Mm -hmm. instead of being five minutes into the show and go, Oh, I don't know what's happening. And so they were capitalizing on a behavior in order to capture a, that behavior and that traffic and then hold on to it. And so when you think about what is your differentiation? How do you compete when everybody's a media company? Look at what cable was doing. Look at how they were creating shows in order to uh, not just like have content that people wanted to watch, but thinking about how it's programmed. How do you get people to go from one piece to the next piece? How do you keep their attention, hold their attention? How do you put out the show that is what's talked about at the office water cooler on Monday, like thinking that versus just, Oh, here's a topic that I need to write about. Not to get too cynical, but like, can we compete with other media forms like Netflix that are purely interested in attracting our attention and really extracting almost all of our attention? That's their whole goal. Um, Can a data visualization software really compete with that? And like, actually Furthermore, are, do we have good examples of, of good media media marketing examples of, of current companies? So I think you have, it's not in B2B. I mean, ProfitWell is probably the closest because they've built franchise properties that uh, if you think of their shows, and Patrick has talked about this, their shows are like thinking like a media company does of like, this show targets this cohort of our demographic and audience. This show is a different one, but there's a little bit of overlap. And so they know that the audience of this show will go to this show and this show to that show. And so they're thinking about how all of the media properties work together. The same way like Disney thought about how someone who watches the movies will go to the park and buy the merchandise and so on. And so they are the closest. Everything else that I see happening that's doing it right is like, not in B2B. And I don't even know if you would consider it B2C, but like, you know, Calm Headspace doing their stuff in Netflix. So I don't know if they would create Mm. their own sort of like channel, but hell, if you really want to think about it, think about how Disney pulled all of the Marvel stuff off of Netflix so they could have it on Disney Plus. So they have their own channel. So they have all of the data. I think that's like what you would be seeing uh, in a way that someone's doing it. Uh, Formula One, 
no one gave a shit about Formula One until there was a Netflix series, and all of a sudden, everyone's a Formula One fan. Um, we we care like, about Formula One down in Austin, Texas, because we have a track. But point taken. <laughs> but like, that's the thing is like, how do those things come about? Media, and if you study media and you understand media theory and media strategies, you understand that media completely shapes uh, the culture of something. And I think why. We're going from content to content marketing to media marketing is this idea of not just publishing shit to earn trust, but publishing stuff to create brand affinity because you're actually a leader in the culture of a profession. If I was to focus on B2B. So if I was targeting marketing, like that's what the hustle is. The hustle is actually pushing things that way. Um, and so when you create a media company or think like a media company, you're like not just publishing content to gain um, that audience, but you're also thinking, how do I like become part of the, what everyone's talking about on Slack? How do I get into those like decentralized channels that we were saying? So like there's places that paid media or in paid advertising can't reach. You're not going to get on a circles, uh, a circle community. You're not going to get on a super path community. None of those things, unless you actually have a direct sponsorship with them. You can't just like feed money into Google ads to get to reach that audience. So how do you get there? You- so what I'm hearing is media marketing is an even longer game than SEO. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, even longer game. And here's the thing I need to make sure I say is that they feed into one another. So everyone always says like, oh, but media companies use ads as revenue. Therefore, it's like a moot point to try and be like a company. The ad revenue model of your uh, internal um, media company is your typical content engine, the revenue engine that sort of aids product awareness. Mm -hmm. And instead of advertising for some other person who's paying money, if you have like a podcast, right, you have a little commercial break where you do like a more creative spin on product awareness, where you maybe say like a little commercial that sort of does like the infomercial stuff. I can't really come up with something off the top of my head, but as long as it's not intrusive and creative enough, you've done enough to like expose someone to something new about your product. And you can do that all the way at the top of the funnel in the brand affinity content. And so the revenue model and the measurement framework for this needs to be better laid out. Like gong stalking is the best I can tell you to do for the very top of the funnel brand affinity stuff is just do, uh, I forget what it's called because I don't have access to gong right now, but like where you track keywords and mm-hmm. what people are saying and phrases and do people talk about your podcasts? Do people say like ad and podcast and review that stuff on a monthly basis but that needs to be better automated we need better attribution right now like i see it as you're growing different audiences i think i listened to a while back uh you all you did a kitchen side with tommy about audience and defining audience and so um you have your broader audience like people who would potentially be interested in your world not even your content just your world And then you have, um, trying to think of how to best say it, like then there's like your community, people who might know about your brand or are part of like a profession or part of a community that your brand is part of. And then there's your audience, like the people who are actually consuming your content, whether they're doing it on a regular basis or a one-time basis. And then there's your customers. And so if you're doing this right, you're, you should be seeing the growth of the last three growing together. And so it's about, um, I think I wrote it down because I know I wanted to talk about it, is like the growth of that cohort. The co- community, is it growing? The audiences, is it growing? And customers, are they growing at the same rate? Then that you can triage by looking at the engagement and conversion of that. So like, are people who are in my market and consume like you know uh is the engagement on like a social channel um correlated to a growth in my audience is a growth in audience or a higher engagement of uh my audience leading to someone becoming part of uh becoming a customer so 
it's the same stuff we've been using just instead of it being on third party platforms like somewhere you're sort of aggregating it all together one question I, i'm gonna have to wrap up pretty soon because i have to do this silly crossfit class and get back in shape but i uh <laughs> so i look at uh acquisition channels on a matrix and i think about like um you know do i have to build this do i have to partner with somebody or do i have to buy do i have to pay to get into this and i think the bulk of the discussion has been around like building your own media efforts building your own channels building your own communities the podcast whatever you, your your kind of route is um now let's say like ali is a curmudgeon executive who has mostly advertising experience loves you know a big ad budget doesn't really trust content, doesn't really think social is paying off, all that stuff. So like when you're presented with the option of like, say, building a community like Superpath or building a YouTube channel like Ahrefs or, you know, any of these examples, building a newsletter like The Hustle, how do you make the case that you build those things versus simply buying an advertisement or a sponsored slot on those channels? I mean, could you test that it's even worth it just by buying a slot first? Um, and wouldn't that allow you better optionality and, and diversification than maybe spending a lot of time and effort on what could amount to be a sunk cost? I definitely believe in testing before building. Um, when I first started testing out the like content that never talks about the product, I did it very lightweight at Eventbrite to see if it further engaged, if it proved my hypothesis that it had built in distribution, that those people would share that stuff. Um, I also tested out things where like the hero story about, you know, Ali uh, could drive traffic to the case study featuring Ali. And so testing out those things, the other th way to prove it to a curmudgeon um, executive is trade-offs. You, you there's compounding effect with content, and if you are, if your audience is compounding, which is why I said the measurement of the different audiences need to grow. If you are continuing to grow an audience, you spend less acquiring them. So the we should see and the trade-off would be we can keep paying and in x amount of years this is how much we'll be paying to reach the same amount of audience or we can start to use this lever here in order to bring that cost down so I buy it's that. always about trade-offs yeah, an executive would definitely hear that ali do you buy it sorry i love ad spend too much <laughs> That's fine. I mean, <laughs> I think in some cases we were talking about making the case and all that stuff. Um, I think sometimes you do need somebody who just believes in a vision as well. And you could definitely like, I think the testing point you made, Ronnie, is great. Um, but <laughs> if you have an executive who's totally against it, you know, a lot of companies, I mean, a lot of good companies out there. Gonna happen. And I mean, if you are someone who, like me, who believes on it, you move on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I well, mean, I'm in a job hunt right now and that was pretty much my thing is i'm not going somewhere where people don't believe in marketing and they don't believe in content or they have a completely archaic outdated view of content so i love it yes. all right i think this is a good place to wrap up yeah this is thank so you so much ronnie thanks for thanks for joining us no this is awesome would love to continue talking about it but yeah you gotta go go get in shape 